Thank you. Uh, uh, this part is the opposite of what we did the last time and asking to what extent do parents have the right to decline unwanted medical treatment and then of course the subsidiary and very important issues if there's a dispute who gets to decide and more importantly on what basis on what standard. Perhaps the most important article written in all of bioethics the first in, was Duffin Campbell's famous article on moral decisions in the newborn nursery back in the New England Journal in 1973. And they were the first, very brave, courageous article, very first to describe the fact that decisions to withhold and withdraw treatment were being made. 14% of the cases at Yale New Haven were involved in uh, these kinds of decisions. And they said, these are terribly difficult trying decisions. Who should make them? And they <coughs> argued in that article, parents. They're the ones who bear the responsibility, so they should make the decisions. I subsequently had an opportunity writing with uh, Richard McCormick on this issue and said, as great an article as it was, there's a substantial problem with the argument that they make. Namely, on what basis do the parents decide not to? Because the most famous of the cases in all of bioethics, the first of them, was the famous Johns Hopkins case. Back in 1963, a child born with Down syndrome and duodenal atresia, the parents sophisticated, mom's a nurse, dad's a lawyer, they have two other children, and they say, this would be too heavy a burden. We don't want the surgery. And the doctors at Johns Hopkins didn't challenge that. In fact, said, we see no reason to challenge it because we don't believe any court would overrule parents on an issue like this. And as Dr. Foss put it, nor would most physicians. 77% of the physicians polled said they would respect that kind of a decision back in 1963. But it created a furor, people saying, how could this happen? And in fact, Dr. Foss tells you, today there's not a physician in the country who would accept a parental decision to refuse surgery in a similar case. What happened? Why the shift? Disability activism. What else? What in 1960, and I don't think too many, as I look around this audience, too many of you go back that far. But I see Truman Katz there. I think he went back to 1960. I was in college. He was working. We didn't call these kids disabled. We didn't call them Down's children. What did we call them? Mongoloid idiots. It's true. And that term conveyed what we understood about them. We thought they were monsters, that they were aberrations, that they were so handicapped there was no possibility of doing anything. And today, if you had a child born with that degree of severity that you would describe it as a monster, a child born with a teratoma, you wouldn't think of treating it, would you? Absolutely not. So there was nothing really morally wrong with the way we were approaching it. What was wrong was the epistemological perception of what these children were. In fact, today, if you're going to train young medical students about Down's children, how do we do it? You bring in a 10-year-old Down's child and let them see them. That's how they learn about it. So there was a huge shift. And what we're talking about, really, is three sorts of factors interacting. The physician, the patient or the proxy with children, and the society, and all have a role. The physician's role, make the diagnosis. They're exquisitely good at this. They never rest till they get one, do they? We try. We try. They keep working at it. They tinker around till they get it. In fact, sometimes you see in adult ICUs, the patient is dying, and the physician's unwilling to give up because, quote, we haven't made the diagnosis yet. You can't die till we have all the enzymes correctly lined up. Then the prognosis. Now this, based upon the physician's experience, knowledge, what can you predict about this? Now physicians are exquisitely great at going and giving the good news, are they not? But if the prognosis is grim, what do they do? Yeah. Hide. <laughs> Comment to the lawyer yesterday, I want to go under the desk, you know. Oh, it's not looking good. <laughs> or we're going to have to work. Franz Engelfinger, in a wonderful article written in the New England Journal way back in 1980 called Arrogance, he says, 
look, the physician shouldn't just go and spread this array of venerables before the patient or the patient's family and say, it's your child, you decide. He said, you have responsibility of making a recommendation. Then the family, based on their own personal psychosocial values, and they run the continuum. That gray area goes a long way, can decide whether or not they wish to do it. And then society comes in, and this is the important part. Society comes in to do two things. To protect, particularly with children, but even with adults, to protect them from overtreatment that may be unwanted. All those cases of Quinlan de Cruzan were pleased to society saying, we don't want the treatment these doctors are trying to impose on us. Hard to believe that for all those years, doctors are trying to make people do what they didn't want. And who was doing it? Doctors were doing it. If you recall back to Quinlan, all the physicians in the Quinlan case in the trial testified removing a ventilator from a ventilatory dependent patient would be murder. The Attorney General of New Jersey, the District Attorney of the County, all said this would be murder. And the trial judge said, of course we can't authorize this. And in fact, he appoints the treating physician to be the guardian to protect this woman from her parents. The New Jersey Supreme Court, with Justice Hughes writing the opinion, came to a far better understanding, saying this woman, that the state's interest in preserving life diminishes when the quality of that life, and some people don't like that word, but McCormick says it's invariable, reaches a certain point. And who makes that decision? The patient himself or those who can speak for the patient? Now, Dr. Faust was right when he said, reasons matter. What's the rationale? What's the standard we're going to use for making the decisions? Duff and Campbell said, we'll just leave it to the parents. Well, the problem with that is good, caring, loving parents can make horrendously bad decisions. And you've seen them, haven't you? Yeah. Why do good, caring, loving, we're not talking about evil, abusive parents, but why do good, caring, loving parents make terrible decisions, in your view? <laughs> they don't love the kid. No. no that's, that's not it. That's not it. They think they're doing the best interest of their child. But why do they get it so wrong, in your view? Emotions. Ignorance, fear, anxiety. And do you really want to say, we'll give to those people overwhelmed with emotion, unable to hear what the doctor's telling them, are we going to then say, but you're the parent, you decide? Do we really want to do what Bob Trug said? Let them do what you think is wrong because they're the decision, they're the deciders. Or do we have society got some obligation to come in and protect them from this overtreatment or undertreatment? And that's where society comes in. Now, it's at the margins. We heard somebody yesterday saying, well, how could we have this gray area? in which people can decide yes or people can decide no. Well, because there's a lot of gray. If I were going to entitle this talk, I think I'd call it, When is Gray Not Black and White? <laughs> we saw yesterday, I talked just briefly about a case. Well, let me, let me do a different way of thing. Let me just show you how we've shifted standards in this country. It's easy to sit here in 2007 and say, we all understand, we've heard Dr. Ross, we all agree, best interest is the standard on which we are to base these judgments. There's an article that Laney Ross has got in an upcoming book giving a little history of where we've been over the last four decades on this. And Laney will tell you, we've been all over the map. We started with Hopkins and saying, whatever the parents do, that's where we will go. It was a famous case in Maine, then this makes wacky Wisconsin look mild, <laughs> called Maine Medical Center versus Hool. It was a child born with a whole series of terrible problems. The dad says, omit the surgery. Somebody at the Maine Medical Center objects and the case goes to court. And the judge there, named Judge Roberts, gives the following ruling. If there's a medical need and there's a medically feasible response, it must be done. What's the judge arguing? What's that? Mandatory treatment. Mandatory treatment. Provided it can be done, it must be done. Good idea. Not always. 
Not always. Why not? In fact, that idea was adopted by the United States at one point, was it not? The so-called famous baby dough rigs. You must treat them all indifferent to what happens. Why is it not such a great idea? Because we don't always, not, not everyone bears the cost in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, no one's really that good at the crystal ball for the future. And there are lots of uh, the long-term consequences that follow from those decisions that... Oh, but just go and give me the short-term consequences of mandatory treatment of everybody. The short-term consequences are... Terrible suffering on the part of those patients prolonging the dying process when it's an inevitable. And, no one, and Richard McCormick, who was a, a, a great, great commentator on bioethics, one of the real founders of it, wrote a famous article in 1974 in JAMA called To Save or Let Die, Who Makes These Decisions? And he's talking about this case. And he says, the trouble with this case is there is no moral obligation to do everything possible to sustain every life. And then he raised a very interesting series of theological questions published in JAMA. And he says, you have to ask the fundamental question, what is life itself? And why is life? And what's the purpose of life? And then you understand what the obligations of life are. Now he, operating out of his Christian context, says life is a gift from God and it's been given for a purpose. And he's talking pure Catholic theology, pure Christian theology, that Anybody old enough to, to learn the Baltimore Catechism? We won't go to Dr. Katz. <laughs> no one's going to admit it. But, but the question, and I used to ask this, ask the, what's that? I was there, but wrong religion. Wrong religion. <laughs> Saying, why did God, well, you ask this question of college students today and say, why did God make you? And they look. I said, yeah, it's a good question. So. <laughs> and that's the answer they have. There's this blank look, you know. Well, if you found any woman over 75 of Irish Catholic background, she'd say, glory be to God, don't you know anything? God made you to know, love, and serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. And McCormick takes that as the fundamental capturing of what Christian theology is. Namely, life has a purpose, and its purpose is serving God, which you do through serving of your neighbor, which he then says means you have to have the ability for relationships. If that ability is exhausted or non-existent, the life doesn't have no value, but its value has reached its zenith, and then there's no purpose for continuing it. It's a very interesting theological way of getting to say, life is good, but not an absolute good, and the obligation to sustain it is a limited one, limited by the ability to return you as as Judge Armstrong puts in the Dynasty case, to being a functioning, cognitively alert, existing human being. If you're permanently unconscious, what's, how are you going to do this relationship then? McCormick comes there, but that wasn't always prevailing. I heard somebody discussing the fact that she's from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Now, where is she? Ah, is, ah, you didn't think I was listening. <laughs> Your hospital is the site of probably one of the most infamous cases in bioethics, namely Baby Andrew, baby Andrew the long dying of Baby Andrew, the Stinson case. Child was born, 800 grams, it was a 5% survival rate at the time for that child's status. Born in a community hospital and the family is told that very risky, they say, we don't want any aggressive measures, but try. They do, the child gets some serious problems and transfer it to a major pediatric intensive care unit now known as CHOP. And there was no stops, no exit, and no appeal. And the parents were told when they asked to have limitation on the treatment, why don't you just put a pillow over his head? What you're asking is illegal and immoral, and we wouldn't consider it. Now, it's interesting. Somehow along the line, baby Andrew accidentally dislodges the ventilator, and the doctors say, Eureka! Now we can orchestrate the death. We have no obligation to put it back in. And he dies. And the family write, uh, writes a book called The Long Dying of Baby Andrew, chronicling it. And it's a pretty sad commentary on the physician's view that they and they alone had the authority to make all decisions on the treatment of that child. And the parents were told just go away. 
Those were the standards by which we practiced medicine in this country not so very long ago. And certainly the baby doe regulations became a part of it. How do we, so at least you get the humility of saying, we've been all over the place. Parents can do whatever they want and we'll do whatever they chose. You must always treat if it's physically possible. It's immoral and illegal not to treat. And then we, came, we come to the case, and all these cases are in your packet there, but the one called Guarantee My Child Will Be Normal. I talked about that yesterday. This was a child, a twin child born, and the parents, father at least, and then the mother agreeing, saying, stop the ventilator if you, can get, if you cannot guarantee he'll be normal. And you say, we're not going to do that. Why? Because this child has some independent claims. Now, if you want to go forward with this, and Dr. Ross talked about the Chad Green case this morning, and that was a case I was involved in a really long time ago. And the involvement became, I was driving up to Vermont, and I hear on the radio about this case of a young child with leukemia. The parents had moved from Nebraska to Boston to provide high-class medical care for their child. He was undergoing chemotherapy, he was re severe reactions to it, and the mother finally determined he's dying and I don't want him, in her words, to die like a dog. So she stopped taking him to the Mass General. The doctors at the Mass General were a little frustrated, but what could they do? And then a Supreme Court opinion in Massachusetts came down in the Sakowitz case, and the court in the process of that case ruled that, to dis that any decision to withhold life-sustaining treatment from a patient, incompetent patient, required court authorization. So the lawyers at the Mass General said, Eureka, if you must have court authorization, we are now going to take this case to court. But here's what they did. The treating physician and the attorney for the hospital went to the local probate court and said, this child needs treatment or he'll die. Who do you think should have also been there? They weren't involved. It's what you would call an ex parte hearing, which you will tell me is? It's uh, only one side is heard. And that's? And it's, not, it's forbidden. It's forbidden. <laughs> but the Mass General marches in with its lawyer, and they get the probate judge to do the following. Remove custody of the child from the parents, appoint the court officer in that court as the guardian, and send him and two sheriffs to the house to seize the kid, which was done. Now this is all on the radio, cause a lot of problems. Now the family gets a lawyer and they want to have a new hearing and they go back to the same court, to the judge. Now he's got CBS and NBC and CNN there. <laughs> You're an attorney, are you not? Yes. Yeah, she says, <laughs> You find them out, you flush them out, you get them, you know. <laughs> what does this judge think now that he's got all the cameras outside his office? I better do the right no. 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 I'm not going to hear this case. Punt. Right out of this case. You've got a problem? Go down to the juvenile court and take care of your kid over there. And they go to the juvenile court and they have a hearing and the judge says, the data are such that this is in that gray area and the parents are free to decide to treat or not treat. Say, end of the case. In fact, your advice counsel to that family would be at this moment? Go back to Nebraska. Get out of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts <laughs> while it's still safe. They're as wacky as Wisconsin. The Mass General, of course, says, oh, we're not satisfied with this. We'll appeal. And then they got another court, and they got the order to treat, and then the case went on. But you have this attempt to move in on the parents when you don't like the decision. I want to talk about two cases that are very interesting, going just the opposite way. Parents asking for non-treatment and showing you how dangerous it becomes. The first of these was a case that caused a lot of fury in the state of Illinois, in the city of Chicago, called the Linares case. And Laney's very familiar with this case. This was a child, a one-year-old child, is at a birthday party. And one thing you know about birthday parties that you should never have with small children is balloons. And the kid gets a balloon, ingests it. By the time they 
go across the street and get it extracted at the fire station, the child suffered massive anoxic damage. The child's at Rush Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago, and after several months of diagnosis, they tell them that the child is in a persistent vegetative state, and in fact, they're going to transfer the child to a pediatric nursing home. Dad says, would you remove the ventilator? The physician says, I agree, that's the appropriate thing to do, but the lawyer for our hospital tells us exactly what the lawyers from Wisconsin did, only a little bit more, unless you're brain dead or have a valid living will, the removal of life support in the state of Illinois would be homicide. Tell the parents to go to court and see if they can get a court order. Now that's nice to say, but if a parent came to you seeking this kind of advice, what would be the very first question that you would pose to the family? Hmm. Now think. You practice law, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. The first thing you're going to tell this family, you want to give them real informed consent about where we're going, What's the fee going to be? <laughs> That's the first thing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I guess, yeah, so. I guess so. <laughs> so you're going to say to this young couple, working class people, what, what do you think it would cost to take this case to court? $2,000 at least. At least, but you want up front because it could get messy. <laughs> oh, God, I know, $10,000. $10,000, exactly right. Up front, cash. No checks. <laughs> well, Dad decided to take action into his own hands. He went into the hospital, visits the ICU, takes out a Magnum 357, points it at the child's head and says, if you come near me, I'll shoot the baby. He doesn't threaten the staff. He disconnects the ventilator. He waits a half an hour. He puts the gun down. What do you want to do now? Leave him alone. Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> this man has guns in his hand. Huh? <laughs> Let me go over to another one. That was a real case. What happened to him? The DA calls it murder. I then got a call actually from the attorney representing the family to speak on their behalf, and then got a call from the Chicago Tribune asking me if I'd write an op-ed piece on the case. <laughs> You're old enough to know how to write these. What would you write? Put this into a framework for us and see what we'd say. I wouldn't take that on. Dr. Katz, you're running a children's hospital. You say, don't come in here with guns. <laughs> and, and, don't kill our, and don't kill our patients. And don't kill our patients. Katz went right for the bait. <laughs> Was this murder? Did he kill the child? Not a lot of agreement with your view. But let's see one who does kill his child. The messenger case. This was a very messy case in Lansing in 1996. It's not an old case. Gregory Messenger is a dermatologist. His wife is pregnant. In the 25th week of the pregnancy, she gets preeclampsia or, or something or other. Whatever it is that she's got, it's now a life-threatening condition. And the physicians are quite convinced, the obstetricians, we're going to have to induce delivery today. They bring a neonatologist in. Any neonatologist here? You know, it's amazing. Go to Children's Hospital and no neonatologists. There's one over there. There's one over there. The following data you'll tell me are not correct, and they're not. The doctor tells, because these are the data for 23 weeks, not 25, but dermatologists know what about neonatology? Nothing. Dermatologists know what about what? Uh. Skin. Skin, right. I go to them all the time. Believe me, they love Irish skin. Uh, he's told, dad is told, and mom, there is a 50 to 70 percent mortality. If the child does survive, there's a 20 percent chance of significant neurological devastation, and there are all the other problems of marked prematurity. 
Dad and Mom both say we don't want any aggressive measures taken and we don't want any resuscitation. Legitimate decision? Sure. Especially with data like that. That's the gray area. They could say do everything or they could say not. The nurse administrator of the NICU says stop, wait. The law requires and hospital policy insists that any child born of 500 grams or more must be resuscitated. And the ultrasound indicated 625 grams. Now if the administrator of the NICU tells you that this is required, what are you going to do? You're going to comply. So they resuscitate the child and put it on a ventilator. Now the doctor in fact leaves the hospital at 6.30 and leaves it in the hands of her physician's assistant and says if the baby is, quote, vigorous, intubate, but if not, don't. The baby is born black, floppy, lifeless looking. The anesthesiologist and the obstetrician think it's dead, but the nurse detects a heartbeat in the umbilical cord and resuscitates. Dad, who's present, says, we don't want this. What happened in Australia? Uh, probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go ahead. Probably wouldn't go ahead, but she's already gone ahead. And she says, I'm not authorized to remove. I'm only authorized to do. You better call the neonatologist. She comes back into the hospital, 11.30 at night. The child is pink and stable. And she says, I'd like to try surfactant. Dad says, would you excuse us, please? He closes the door. And he, Dad, shuts off the ventilator. Opens the door and says, the baby's dead. Now, oh, Dr. Katz, what do you want to do? Send him to jail. The district attorney said, this is homicide. This child died, says the coroner, because the ventilator was shut off. And now dad's attorney says, we need a sophisticated, articulate, intelligent defense. And where would we go other than to Seattle? <laughs> is this murder? Mayhem, or what? Dr. Stapleton, can you come to this defense, or do you want to prosecute? You can go either way. It's a free society. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know that I know enough to make that decision. I think that... Well. <laughs> <laughs> to know that you don't know is the beginning of wisdom, says Socrates. <laughs> so I, and Stapleton is a wise man. He's not going to venture out onto that platform one inch. I'd like to know more. I think that it could go either way, depending on... Which way do you want to go? You can consult your ethics consult here if you'd like. Well, I certainly would. <laughs> <laughs> it's two of them, right? One behind the other. They're lined up there. I'm not a cop. <laughs> my, initial, my initial response in these instances is generally to try and understand the parents, their motivation, and, and what they're doing in the interest of the child. Well, let's go back. All right. Did you find it acceptable for Greg Messenger and his wife to say on this, what they thought was a 23-weeker, so we have to go with the data they had, right? Would it be appropriate and acceptable to say, no aggressive measures for this child, please? Yes. And did they? Yes. And should that have been dispositive? Yes. yes. And why wasn't it followed? Because the neonatologist had a different theory. She said, we adopt a wait and see. Put him on. If he does poorly, we'll stop. I'd like you to reconsider. She never comes back to him. And she certainly doesn't give him the opportunity of going to Dr. Diekma or to Dr. Wilma or to Dr. Katz, or to Dr. Mercurio, she decides, I'll have my PA do what I want. And the PA does. And then dad comes in and does it his way. Now, is this murder? Interestingly, the coroner said, if they had not put the child on the ventilator, the child would have died, and that would have been natural, but they ignored the parent's legitimate request and put it on anyhow. Does that change what should be done for the child? 
Hmm. Or put it this way, Stapleton, is it? It is. Yeah. Put it this way, Dr. Stapleton. Did that child have a right to be free of unwanted medical interventions? Yes. And who would make that decision for the child who obviously couldn't speak for himself? Parents. And they made it. Now somebody on her own authority decides to override that legitimate decision of the child. Is the child then bound by that outlier's choice? I don't know the answer to that. I would, I really don't know. Why should he be? Because if it is, then every doctor could come along and put her own views on every child, couldn't she? And say, you had a choice, but you didn't leave the facility, and as long as you're here and we did it our way, you're trapped. Right. You want that? No. no. That was the argument made in the court, actually, was that this child had a right to be free of unwanted medical interventions. That right was violated by the actions of the PA at, against the directions, incidentally, of the neonatologist. And the child was, quote, liberated from the unwanted medical interventions by the father. Not a good way to run hospitals, but what do you do when you've been pushed into a corner? How? Let me just see, there's one other thing. So that jury took exactly two hours to come back with not guilty. You say, did the parents have the right to make the decision? Did they make it? Should it have been respected? And if it wasn't, then what? And a jury, at least of the peers in Lansing, said, we're not going to find the actions of Greg Messenger to be morally reprehensible. What we find is it shouldn't have happened. There's one case that causes no end of consternation in a very, very famous case in Texas called Miller versus HCA. And HCA, as you know, is yeah. Hospital Corporation, very large, the largest, biggest for profit hospital corporation in the United States, founded by Senator Frist's dad. You know Senator Frist. Her, yeah. yeah, the man who can make diagnoses at a distance. <laughs> Cardio, yep, we do it, the Christian science do it. Frist ruined his, rep ruined his president's dental aspirations with that dumb move in Shiloh. But, <laughs> oh, he would have been a serious candidate. Uh, here's the case. Uh, very similar, 23 week gestational age, family doesn't want to, this is the one actually where the nurse comes in. I conflated those cases. They say, we don't want any aggressive treatment. This is where the nurse says, you must have over 500 grams. It's done. The child is terribly compromised. Uh, seven years later, when the lawsuit comes, the child is in one of the worst conditions possible. So much so that the jury decides that the lifetime cost of caring for this child will be an award, $27 million. They also decide that the, you have to teach, and here was the argument from the plaintiff's attorney, why did HCA do this? Now, in fact, there was no law and there was no hospital policy. Think now, as a plaintiff's attorney, what argument would you make to the jury as to why HCA did this? Counsel. To get some money. Yeah. To make money. You know a 23-weeker is a huge cost uh, uh, generator, profit generator. Now, you go to a jury and say, these people did it in order to make money. Now, in comes punitive damages, meaning damages awarded to keep bad people from doing bad things again, or others to follow them. So that was another 17 million. And there was 13 million in accumulated interest. So the total payment was $60 million. Now, even in Texas, that causes eyebrows <laughs> to be raised. <laughs> now, do we have anybody, any lawyers from Texas here? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, because Texas has an interesting judicial system. Uh, it bifurcates its court. It has a court of criminal appeals. That's the highest court for criminal. And the Supreme Court only does civil cases. They also have elected judges. Now, if you have elected judges who only do civil things, what do you think the lobbyists do about these judges? Oh, they, they give them lots of money in mm. their elections. 
They want corporate-oriented judges sitting up there. $60 million against the corporation didn't sit too well. How was they going to do with this case? And they had the case for three years. It was on appeal. And the Supreme Court of Texas came out with the following. We understand the great American tradition, the Anglo-Saxon tradition, starting with John Stuart Mill, that over his body, every individual is sovereign. We understand Schlorendorf, that every competent adult can decline unwanted medical treatment. We understand that touching a, uh, without consent is a battery. We understand all that. But what do we do in the face of a newborn infant at 23 weeks? And the court said, there's an exception to the need for informed consent in, quote, emergent circumstances. That is, when the situation is such that there's no time to discuss it with the family and there's no time to seek court review, the neonatologist, only for children incidentally, the neonatologist or a pediatrician may intervene without consent and may touch because the alternative is the child will die. And they argued on the following two things. With a newborn, it's impossible to tell whether or not they will thrive or die. And it's all speculation. So the neonatologist must intubate, if he chooses, may intubate rather, not must, if he chooses, in order to assess and evaluate and make a judgment. So here you find the Texas court, and, and of course, say that's what was done, and so the judgment is thrown out. But you have the court saying, in cases in which parents say no, the neonatologist may treat even over the parental objections if the neonatologist is uncertain about the outcome. Well, Dr. Mercurial, the neonatologist is uncertain about the outcome, except in one case. Except in one case? I'm uncertain about the outcome only up, well, after the patient's dead, I'm no longer uncertain. Right. <laughs> I knew that Yale would not disappoint. Well, they're better there than they are at UCLA. I, I gave a talk at UCLA a couple of years ago on non-heart-beating cadaver organ donors. It was to the Department of Neurology. And one of the senior attending neurologists stops me before I even start, and he said, before you even get started, I want to know what in the hell is a heart-beating cadaver? <laughs> to which Dr. Mercurio would reply to him, Doctor, you must be brain dead if you don't know. <laughs> you wanna, he just want to go under that table, you know. So, so, yeah. The only time you have complete certainty is if it's dead. And then you can't even be completely certain, can you? Depends on how long he's been dead. Depends on how long he's been dead, right. <laughs> newborns. Four famous cases of newborns with auto-resuscitation. You pronounce them dead? Well, the, one, of the, one of the most interesting, and this is a total distraction the way that uh, Ben gave you total distraction, but it's a good story. Uh, he's testifying in court about a baby who breathes on his own. The doctor pronounces him dead, stillborn. He says, I don't hear any heartbeat. The nurse says, I heard a heartbeat. He listens, doesn't hear it. They try for 10 minutes, he stops. And writes, app goes 000, and baby stillborn. Ten minutes later, the baby is crying, <laughs> lustily. The baby is now a year old, severely brain damaged. This being America, of course, now we're in court. And the argument was going to be the doctor was basically dumb. <laughs> right. Or deaf. Or deaf and dumb. <laughs> but he clearly was negligent. And of course, McCurry would argue, not necessarily. I said, he was well trained, he had the stethoscope, he wasn't deaf. Regular heartbeat could be there. And they don't listen for the whole minute, they listen for a few seconds, multiply by five or whatever it is you guys do. <laughs> I, I don't do this. I'm not a doctor, I'm, not, I'm just a simple teacher of religion, I don't know anything about these. But there I am on the stand, and finally, in exasperation, the attorney looks at me and he says, well, he wasn't dead, was he? Now, the kid's in the courtroom crying. <laughs> Dr. Mercurio, you would say? Apparently not. 
and you fall right into the trap. The doctor must have been dead if he thought, uh, dead, dumb if he thought he was dead. His negligent assessment of the child resulted in the uh, damage, and you lose that answer. Your inspiration should have been Bill Clinton. It depends upon what the meaning of dead is. <laughs> Do you mean dead dead? <laughs> so that even a judge would understand? Or do you mean apparently dead and resuscitatable? Or apparently dead and non-resuscitatable? Or imminently dying and reversible? Or apparently dying and non-reversible? because whichever you have in mind in your question alters the answer. Yes, he was dead in the judgment of the physician because he had no heartbeat. 10 minutes of attempt, resuscitation didn't work. That in your judgment, Dr. Mercurio, would be dead. dead. Right. So he was dead epistemologically in the mind of the physician. And then once the physician was convinced he was dead, what should the physician have done? Stopped. Stopped, right. So was it an error by the judge, by the doctor in stopping? No, not at all. But that's wholly way, way, way from where we are. Uh, let me see where I was. <laughs> what you have in all of this, as we said yesterday, <clears throat> putting it into a big framework is you have a long, a very long continuum from cases in which you absolutely owe a duty to the patient independent of the parental decision to stop or to go forward. And on the other side, you have an absolute duty to the patient to say stop even if the parents, uh, to continue even if the parents want to. That's guaranteeing my child. You got this enormous big gray area. And it causes a great deal of, of anxiety on the part of patients watching decisions being made. And I'll give you what I think was the most difficult case that I've ever ever encountered, of giving you an example of the gray area. Uh, I'll give you a preliminary case to it and then the case. The first I saw this was a case we had at Children's Oakland Hospital in a long time ago with Virginia Newman, some of you know her, and there was a child, six years old, perfectly normal child, who got severe meningitis and gets severe gangrene in all four extremities. Medically, not terribly difficult question, who do you ask to consult on the case? No, not infectious disease. We already know it's orthopedic surgeons. And do you ever met one? <laughs> they come, they see, they treat. chop. They don't treat, they cut. cut. Yeah. And, yeah, they, yeah, they come, they see, they chop. It's, that, that doesn't require a lot of ethical analysis, does it? But mom asked an interesting question and absolutely shook the medical staff. Must we do it? And they were thrown for a loop. They, nobody had ever asked a question like that. What do you think? Must, oh, the answer's not in the book. <laughs> yes, we're going to have a stump and a head when we're finished. Yep. And, uh, and mental functioning is Perfect. Six. Probably do it. That wasn't the question mom asked. Must we do it? No. no. Why not? Uh, because there's very serious uh, associated disability and compromise in quality of life. Yeah. And it could be regarded as not an infection. And the way we got to it, because nobody was there at that moment, was if this were you. Would you have to do it as an adult? The answer is no. You could say, I would rather not go on that way. And we recognize that. The question then comes, do, and here's the really important question all of this. Do non-competent patients have the same right to make choices as competent patients? And clearly in this country, the answer has come back yes. And probably the best uh, location for this is in the Sakewitz case in Massachusetts, Supreme Judicial Court, and says, we did, there was a profoundly compromised man, spent his entire life in a developmental institution, profoundly retarded, gets leukemia, and the question is, should we treat the leukemia? 
He had two sisters, one institutionalized, the other said, I haven't seen him in 50 years and won't get involved. So you really have someone without anyone to protect him. They went to court to ask the question, should we give chemotherapy to this patient? Now, the data were very clear. Almost all competent patients similarly situated elect chemo. Would we devalue this profoundly compromised man if we didn't treat him the way we treat the majority of people? And the court said, that's not the issue. The issue is respecting his personal position. And it says, incompetent patients have the same right, and the question is, how do we ascertain it? Well, if he had ever been competent, we could have known from his spoken words or his values, but this man was never competent. And the Supreme Court came up with this phrase that is a terrible A sounding phrase and B idea, but they said, we'll use substituted judgment. Not meaning we substitute the court's judgment for his, but we ask what it is that he would want himself if he could see himself as he is and could make a rational choice for it. Now you ask yourself, why is it that almost every leukemia patient, when given the diagnosis, opts for treatment? To live. To live. Why not treat this man to live? You think so? Why do they opt? They hope to get better, to recover. They're going to experience the pain, but they also have the hope. What's this man going to experience? Suffering that he doesn't understand. Suffering he doesn't understand. Would you, as a rational person, want that? No. No, that's what the court said. He wouldn't want that, and then they stopped it. But, but the important part in that opinion was the very eloquent words of Justice Liakos saying, we devalue the life of this patient not by declining to provide the chemotherapy, but by refusing to accord to him the same choice that we accord to everybody else. And the difficulty is, how are we going to make it for him? Now it's a judicial fantasy, and the Massachusetts Supreme Court, <coughs> I'll tell you what their definition of substituted judgment was. It says, the role of the court is to don the mental mantle of the incompetent, something our Supreme Court does all the time. <laughs> I used that line with all seven of them sitting in front of me last year. They went so far in a case called Baby Billy, a different Baby Billy from the breast, of a child, a couple of months old, the child was in a foster home and comes to New England Medical Center with what appears to be a life-threatening condition. And the question, of course, that immediately comes up among the staff is, should we have a DNR order? What do you think? Well, they thought, if this child is dying and he has a cardiac arrest, maybe there's a better idea not to attempt. But who's going to make that decision? So they went to the court and said, may I? And the court said, yes, you may, because we've discerned that baby Billy, if he understood himself as dying, would not want the imposition of CPR. Well, lo and behold, with the great care he got at New England Medical Center, baby Billy got better. And he's now about to be discharged back to the nursing home, but the DNI rod is still sitting there, isn't it? Should we remove the DNR order from Baby Billy's record? Depends on the circumstances. He's fine. He's recovered from all those problems. Do you have a DNR? Let me write one for you now. <laughs> you think that would be a good idea for you now? Not this moment. No. And so for Baby Billy, so what they did is they went back to the court. And the court said, you're right, maybe Billy shouldn't have a DNR order, and you came to the right people, we are the people who removed it, we are the deciders, and we'll remove it. So what the court did was took an awful lot of authority onto itself here. But here's the case I want to give you. We actually have to cut things out. <laughs> <laughs> because we're, we're about saved by the bell. <laughs> so we, 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 have time, we, ha we have our panel. Um, so.